consequences in government intervention, where governments try to centralise power and in doing so they increase the world's carbon footprint while trying to reduce it. So the, there are some very interesting considerations that your question gives rise to. I myself am not a great believer in the existing transnational en entities. They have tended to become expensive, corrupt, inept, lazy and valueless. Uh, I should like to see the, uh, an end to a lot of them. I don't think they do very much good and I certainly don't see any case whatsoever for allowing the IPCC to continue in existence for a moment longer. I agree entirely with my peer, uh, Lord Lawson of Blaby, who has called for its outright and immediate abolition. Madam, yes. Just Thank you for your kind words and your time tonight. I would just like to ask, uh, how politically viable do you believe a departure from the conventional view on global warming is, and uh, how do you propose to overcome the unbalanced political and media presentation of the issues? Uh, a, a lovely question, that. Uh, right up my street. I think we've just got to, to wait and watch, quietly tell... Uh, the scientific truth as best we understand it without trying to proselytize, without trying to make political points, without trying to score points off the opposition. You know, I didn't choose Al Gore for the sake of poking fun at Al Gore or making ad hominem remarks about him or theorizing as to why he made so many errors. I merely pointed out that there were errors in that film because it is in that film that all the fears which are being peddled by the media and the politicians are encapsulated in one place in, in, in an extraordinary way. So I, I think we need not worry, we need merely wait and gradually the truth will emerge. What we need to do is to try to make sure that in the meantime as little damage is done as possible, particularly in those poorer countries whose citizens are so deeply vulnerable as we've seen in the AIDS and DDT cases, to wrong decisions taken by us uh, to please narrow uh, environmentalist or other specialist vested interests who put their own interest in front of the interest of us all. One more question. Um, you mentioned earlier that the, that, well, the, current, the current major forms uh, of sources of energy are finite. Uh, uh, they aren't renewable. Is, is, is it possible that the, the one of the advantages of the current green movement in uh, advocating increased funding for research and development of renewable resources um, would actually lead to the replacement of these finite sources, I mean, unless, as you mentioned before, fusion, fusion does kick in? As the existing sources of energy become scarcer, so the premium that a private company will gain by finding or exploiting or developing a new source of energy will increase of itself. It doesn't need direction by the state. That's the great thing about the free market. It responds automatically. And there's no advantage whatsoever to be gained by the state trying to get involved and say, we must subsidize windmills, for instance, to some ludicrous extent. Uh, because that is an utterly failed policy. You know, the windmills are, are just not the answer. They, they, they have a, a marginal impact at best, and they only really pay their way in countries where they're heavily subsidised. So uh, there's no need for the state to intervene in any of this at all, because every time the state intervenes, as I've said, it costs twice as much and is half as efficient as if you leave it to the private sector. So uh, my, my feeling would be no, the Green Movement... Um, is not any longer a useful movement. When, it was, when Greenpeace was founded, it was founded by a friend of mine, among others, and within a year he left it because he said it had been taken over by people whose agenda was not that of protecting the environment. It was an avowedly political agenda. Uh, and here I will use the word left because that's the word that he used. And he said, therefore, that it had ceased to be valuable as an instrument of environmental reform and he wanted nothing more to do with it. And I have come across one other of the original founders of Greenpeace who has said the same. So um, my feeling is that the Green Movement now uh, has become too politicised in, in one political direction, and that, of course, reduces its effectiveness anyway. And the solutions that it, in, uh, that it advocates are broadly communistic, and you only have to look at the failed communist countries around the world to see what a disastrous environmental impact they had. And I think we want to steer away from that. The private sector is, in fact, much more responsive to the needs of the environment than any state sector can realistically ever be. And I think this is a case where we just should not intervene. We should 
stand back and allow the private sector to do its job with a, a minimum of sensible regulation, but not with state subvention. And that was the last question, sir. So may I once again thank you, sir, very much indeed for your kindness in having given me the, uh, the ear of the House. I should also, in particular, like to thank all of you who have not only come here but endured several hours of me. I always find this flattering and congenial, but in your case you have asked between you a series of extremely interesting and revealing and helpful questions to which I've done my best to give straightforward answers. And God bless you all. Thank you for listening and good night. <laughs>